I've talked about the photograph as historical witness previously. It's one of the common uses in the early days of photography that continues as well today. Images have long been used to render historic places and events. Prior to the introduction of photography, these were generally illustrated by hand. Over the centuries, a style of history painting developed. History painting is the painting of scenes with narrative content from classical history, Christian history, and mythology, as well as depicting the historic events of the near past. These include paintings with religious, mythological, historical, literary, or allegorical subjects. They embodied some interpretation of life or conveyed a moral or intellectual message. The event, if suitable, did not need to have to actually occur, and artists have frequently taken great liberties with historical facts in order to portray the message desired. While the ability for photographers to manipulate fact existed, as we've seen with combination printing, the public's belief in the veracity of photographs led it to supplant painting as a surrogate witness to history. Photographs allowed for armchair travelers to witness exotic lands and human conflict from the ease of their living rooms. Wars have marked human history, placeholders to eras whose effects were global. Conflict has always been news, as industrialized nations made rapid improvements in communications and transportation, understanding the world outside one's own community became a social, political, and economic necessity. Daily news services became available, and war was always big news. One of the primary initial advances of early lens-based imagery was its use in creating documents. Photographs were recorded to verify his historical facts. The evidence may be as simple and direct as having one's portrait taking, saying, I was here, or images as those from Vietnam or more recently Abu Ghraib that had a direct and real political impact. Despite its early technical limitations, both skilled amateur and professional photographers produced significant records of military activity. Wars affected lives and many were interested in the camera's precise visual documentation of the people, places, and activities of war. Military officers, decision makers in the field, political decision makers at home, as well as the visual proof of war's horror in inhumanity. From the beginning, photography was seen as a means of depicting war scenes. The American poet Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in 1863, quote, It is well enough for artists to please an imperial master with fanciful portraits, but war and battle should have truth for their delineator, and photography would be more suitable for this. Serving as historical witnesses, photographers and their publishers had the ability and possibility to make a profit on war coverage. While the modern sentiment assumes that the absence of war is normal, as Susan Sontag pointed out, the presence of war has so far prevailed throughout photography's history. With the earliest surviving images of the Mexican-American War, from 1846 to 1848, over the annexation of Texas, there have been images made that have concerned every major armed conflict since. To some extent, it is difficult to avoid seeing pictures showing the ravages of war. Indeed, we have become almost immune to it. To many people, war would be something that was conducted in far-off lands and therefore would conjure up pictures of heroism and romanticism. Writing in the Atlantic Monthly magazine, Oliver Wendell Holmes showed how photography interjected a feeling of grim reality into the situation as he surveyed pictures taken by Matthew Brady's team in the Civil War. Quote, Let him who wishes to know what war is Look at this series of illustrations. These wrecks of manhood thrown together in careless heaps or arranged in ghastly rows for burial were alive but yesterday. 
It gives a sun conception of the repulsive, brutal, sickening, hideous thing it is, this dashing together of two frantic mobs to which we give the name of armies. War photography has raised questions about freedom of the press, with government control inevitably an issue. We saw that recently when the Egyptian government unsuccessfully suppressed the media. In our country, censorship was heavy in World War I, with access to the front for photographers limited. As a result, there were relatively few photographs of actual combat. Governments have at times worked hard to sanitize war imagery. During the Gulf War, the Pentagon had learned from perceived mistakes during Korea and Vietnam, and photographers were kept away from the combat zone except under tightly controlled conditions. Few combat photographs from the Gulf War were published, so that it was left to images of the aftermath to suggest what had happened. When one of these photographs included an image of an incinerated Iraqi soldier, it caused a controversy because of its graphic revelation. The picture was a shocking reminder of what actually happened when our sanctioned view of war was instead video images showing cruise missiles and plane launch bombs along with the official shots of the military and controlled, even stage, circumstances. While photographs can and still do at times shock us, being indoctrinated into media cultures where the content is conflict is entertainment. We see that in TV, inflammatory radio, video games, and films. We are far more numb to images of violence than early generations were. While photographs have long been explicit, and it has been argued that seeing such images desensitize people to the horrors war produces, the first war photographer was an anonymous American who took a number of daguerreotypes during the Mexican-American War in 1847, which I've been showing you. The first known war photographers include Hungarian-Romanian Karl Pop de Swasmari, who took photographs of various officers in 1853 and 1854 of the war scenes during the Crimean War. You see some of those here. Relatively unknown is John McIntosh, an Arby surgeon who may have the distinction of being Britain's first war photographer. He began to take photographs in 1844 while stationed in the Himalayas and took photographs of the Sikh War, 1848, and the Second Burma War, 1852. Following Sathmari to the Crimean was Roger Fenton, who heaved his bulky camera there as well. From a family of 17 children, he inherited a great sum of money. He was a practicing lawyer. He studied art with Paul Delaroche in France, along with Gustave Le Gray and several of the other French photographers that we've studied. He was introduced to photography in 1851 using the calotype process. He soon turned to using Gustave Le Gray's wax paper negative. He didn't work professionally in photography until 1854. He met and became friendly with Queen Victoria and photographed the royal children also in 1854. He had switched to wet collodion process in 1853. He worked as a photographer for the British Museum for seven and a half years beginning that year, 1853. A Manchester publisher, Thomas Agnew, was approached about a cooperative venture to document the Crimean War. Under semi-official patronage, he was to send a photographer to the war to produce pictures that could be sold back home. He suggested Fenton. The backer sought to boost public support for the war. The Crimean War, 1854 to 1856, pitted England, France, Turkey, and Sardinia against Russia in a battle of domination of southeastern Europe. 
often credited Frenton as the first war photographer. Not only is this not true, he wasn't even the first Crimean war photographer. However, he made 306 negatives of the Crimean War and left a great deal of information about that conflict. His photographic van was white. This is his portable darkroom. It was visible for miles and often mistaken for an ammunition wagon was a, and was a favorite target for Russian gunmen. Remember, the wet collodion process is a difficult process. You had to coat a glass plate with light-sensitive material, put that plate in a film holder, carry it out to your camera, which you would assume would already be set up, expose for several seconds, if not longer, take that exposed plate back to the darkroom and process it all before it had dried. Again, you had about a half hour to complete the process. So the fact that photographers made any images of war with these difficult processes is quite remarkable. But indeed, the slowness of the process limited what a photographer could do. A photographer really couldn't be in the heat of battle as they would be aimed at and potentially killed. So instead, in these early war photographs, what we generally see are the troops, officers, or enlisted men, the encampments, and sometimes the aftermath of the battlefield. Clearly, the photographer is posing people to photograph and record for this historic event. Fenton's most famous photograph is also one of the most well-known images of war and remains controversial to this day. Across a desolate and featureless landscape, not a single figure can be found. The landscape is inhabited only by cannonballs, so plentiful that they appear to be rocks that stand in for the human casualties on the battlefield. The sense of emptiness and unease is heightened by the visual uncertainty created by the changing scale of the road and the sloping sides of the ravine. Borrowing from the 23rd Palm of the Bible, the Valley of Death was named by British soldiers who came under constant shelling there. Fenton traveled to the dangerous ravine twice, and on a second visit, he made two exposures. He wrote that he had intended to move in closer at the site, but danger forced him to retreat back up the road where he created this image. In 2007, filmmaker Errol Morris went to Sebastopol to identify the site of this first iconic photograph of war. A second version of the photograph without cannonballs on the road led him to question the authenticity of the picture. Opinions have differed concerning which one was taken first, but Morris spotted evidence that the photo without cannonballs would have been taken first. He remains uncertain about why the balls were moved onto the road in the second picture. Perhaps, he notes, Fenton probably deliberately placed them there to enhance the image. However, according to the Orsay Museum, this is unlikely as the fighting raging around him would probably not have allowed him to do so. The alternative is that soldiers were gathering up cannonballs for use and they threw down the balls higher up the hill and onto the road to collect later. Again, this remains a point of controversy today and we really don't know exactly what happened and why the difference for these two images. It should be noted that there really is at this time no tradition for documentary photography and no tradition for photography as a part of journalism. The image, if it was made today, would have captions and certainly would have uh, informed the photographer how to make the image in terms of its believability. But staging photographs at this point was quite common. <laughs>
Here you can see the two side by side. Again, the staging of photographs was common and frankly necessary given the length of the exposures. You'll see a variety of scenes here, very likely staged for the camera. And you can read his title, Hardships in the Camp, Hardships Lying Around, Drinking Wine, as you see here, or Tending a Wounded Soldier, Staged, Likely, and the Soldier Being Offered a Glass of Wine. Upon his return to Britain, Fenton was summoned by the Queen to see his pictures. She was so impressed that on a state visit to France, she took Fenton's pictures with her and showed them to Napoleon. He too was impressed and invited Fenton as his guest to France. With the rise of popularity and the extreme low cost of the carte de visite, this caused too much competition for photographers, and around 1860, Fenton was to give up photography entirely, his career, though distinguished, lasting just 12 years. Matthew Brady was one of the most celebrated 19th century American photographers. He was best known for his portraits of celebrities in the documentation of the American Civil War. He started out as a Daguerrean photographer. He had galleries in both New York City and Washington, D.C. He won prizes in international competitions for his portraits. Brady photographed President Lincoln, royalty, and celebrities in his studios. He became known as Lincoln's photographer. He had an agreement with the War Department, which allowed his photographing of the Civil War. Brady's efforts to document the Civil War on a grand scale by bringing his photographic studio to the battlefields earned his place in history. He spent over $100,000 of his own money Matthew Brady was the first to undertake the photographic documentation of the American Civil War, despite the obvious dangers, the financial risk, and discouragement of his friends. He is later quoted as saying, I had to go. A spirit in my feet said go, and I went. His first popular photographs of the conflict were at the first Battle of Bull Run. Brady was nearly killed. He got lost for several days and eventually returned to Washington, D.C., hungry and tired. Here he is in this image with one of his portable dark rooms. This is the period of the wet collodion process. It's a difficult and cumbersome process, and you needed to start and finish within a half hour. Certainly remarkable in conditions of war that any of these photographs were made. But because of the cumbersome equipment and the dangers presented by having a portable darkroom wagon, which could easily be targeted, most photographs of the Civil War were either of the troops, portraits of the officers, or the aftermath of the battlefields. Another example here, several of the Union soldiers with the what's is it wagon, the darkroom wagon in the background. Brady employed Alexander Gardner, James Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, George N. Bernard, a total of 23 men, each of whom were given a traveling darkroom to go out and photograph scenes from the Civil War. Brady largely stayed in Washington, D.C., organizing his assistants and rarely visited the battlefields personally. This may have been due at least in part to the fact that Brady's eyesight began to deteriorate in the 1850s. The question of authorship came up with Brady's employees. Indeed, they wanted credit for the photographs that they were making under the guise of the Brady studio.
This led to conflicts with Brady, who wanted to claim the images as his own, or at least those of his studio. Eventually, Alexander Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, George N. Bernard, and others left Bla Brady's employment and began explorations of their own photographing the Civil War. This is the, the era of glass plates. So in these slides in particular, you can see in this one what we have remaining of the image. This is a broken glass plate. And so if you can see here, it's printed in its totality. More often than not in textbooks, you see images like the one on the left here, where the image on the right includes the entire glass plate. You can see some of the emulsion on the top has deteriorated. That may have been at the time or since, but the plate was also broken. These were difficult circumstances in which the photographers worked, and it wasn't uncommon to have plates cracked or broken. You can see also, this is something we'll see later in the landscape work of the 1870s, the photographer would often scratch into the emulsion, either a, a number of the exposures, sometimes they even put the titles of, of the pieces directly on the photographic plate. The aftermath of one of the battles. as you see here. What Matthew Brady hadn't considered was that after the war, American viewers had little interest in viewing pictures reminding of them of these times. This image is likely one half of a stereo view, so they did full plate collodion negatives, but at the same time often made stereographs as well. Here you can see one of his stereos. Brader's efforts to document these events eventually brought about his financial ruin. Matthew Brady lived the last few months of his life in a rooming house, alone, sick, and destitute. He was left penniless and unappreciated even though he devoted his whole life to preserving the history of his country. Towards the end of Brady's life, he once said about the photographs he took, No one will ever know what they cost me. Some of them almost cost me my life. On January 15, 1896, Matthew Brady died. I wanted to take this opportunity as we go into more photographs of the Civil War, and particularly as we move into the 20th century, with photographs from World War II and Vietnam and others, I wanted to warn viewers about the increasingly gruesome character of some of these images. While the Civil War photographs usually are the aftermath of battlefields, among other kinds of pictures, uh, they're still pretty grisly in places, and uh, again, in the 20th century, even more so. So I just really wanted to give viewers a heads up and a warning as we move forward with this lecture. Alexander Gardner was a Scotsman. He had been a reporter and editor for the Glasgow Sentinel before he immigrated to the United States. He came here in 1856 with the intent to join a socialist society in Iowa. His fare had been paid for by Matthew Brady, as Alexander Gardner was a known early wet plate expert. In 1858, he became manager of Brady's Washington, D.C. studio. Here you can see Alexander Gardner seated in this stereograph in front of his darkroom wagon. He accompanied Brady's Civil War effort, making as many as three quarters of Matthew Brady's images, again with the stamp of Brady's studio. In 1863, he left Brady's employment over arguments over the authorship of his work, knowing that this was a historic documentation of the Civil War and these pictures would likely be seen for generations to come. 
the photographers or many of the photographers in Matthew Brady's employment wanted credit for the images they made. Brady, as I stated before, demanded that he, images made by his employees, by his photographic operators, simply be credited to Brady's studio. Several of his best photographers eventually left. Timothy O'Sullivan, who's one of the next photographers we'll look at, left along with Gardner, and they started their own documentation of the American Civil War. Timothy O'Sullivan became the primary operator for Matthew Brady. Alexander Gardner's photographic sketchbook of the Civil War included a hundred mounted photographs. So these were original photographs that were tipped or glued in to the book. There still remains five known copies. Here you can see the front piece for that publication. And what you're seeing here is the mount like many of the Civil War photographs, they're of the troops and the generals and the officers in down times during the war, and at times the aftermath of the battlefields. Well, I mentioned the pictures were increasingly gruesome. Here's one of them. Again, you can see the wet plate the, where the emulsions are inconsistent, particularly around the edge of the images. And that's partly the coating and partly probably the effects of time on these glass plate negatives. But kind of grisly scenes after the battles before the soldiers had been buried. Another similar image. Eventually, Gardner closed his gallery in 1867, and he later became the field photographer for the Union Pacific Railroad during the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. During that time, he made many interesting landscape photographs and also ethnographic studies of Native Americans, which I'll show you in a minute. He also photographed the conspirators after they had been captured, the conspirators of Lincoln's assassination. What you can't see here, as these images are cropped in such a way that you can't see that these two conspirators have been arrested and they are in handcuffs. He made a series of these photographs of the conspirators. On the left, you can see in handcuffs. And he photographed the gallows where these people were hung. This is from a sequence of photographs. Some is really beautiful studies of Native Americans doing portraits in makeshift galleries. This is a likely a cracked plate. You see the crack here as well. Undoubtedly, the photographer would have cropped to the edges simply to show the Native Americans. And you can see the titles right there, giving the, the names of these people. That looks like it was likely printed onto the glass plate itself. If it was scratched in, Normally, that would show up as black, something blocking the light, like these or the number here, would be something dark placed on that negative, blocks the light to the print underneath. But really fascinating pictures, Native Americans in their native garb. Again here, places where the plate has cracked. Timothy O'Sullivan was born in Ireland about 1840. 
He was one of the youngest and most talented photographers in the American Civil War. I want to give a shout out to one of my close friends, Rick Dingus, who wrote a terrific book about Timothy O'Sullivan, the photographic artifacts of Timothy O'Sullivan. O'Sullivan was an important pioneer American landscape photographer, as well as one of the primary photographers of the American Civil War. He began his career in 1856 or 1857 when he started to work as an apprentice photographer at Matthew Brady's gallery. Timothy O'Sullivan was one of the photographers who was sent to the battlefield by Brady. Like other camera operators, he wanted to keep the negatives of the pictures he had taken. He wanted control and credit for those images that he offered, but Brady would not allow this. The refusal and the fact that Brady would not permit the photographers to sign their pictures were reasons enough for O'Sullivan to break with Brady and to start to work for Alexander Gardner. This is one of his most famous photographs, Home of a Rebel Sharpshooter. It remains a controversy today. Let me show you another version of that image. In this version, owned by the Library of Congress, you can see at the top, the sky has been opaqued out as well as some of the background. It's common practice, combination printing, where you could print in sky separately. So whether this is done on the original negative or a separate negative, a second negative, I don't really know. Uh, but indeed, uh, it would be possible on a second negative to simply use opaque paint to paint this out with the intent that later you could print in a more suitable sky. Let me just go back to that first image. So you can see they also opaqued out some of the background here. But that's not the only reason this image is a controversy. William Frasinito, in his book Gettysburg, A Journey in Time, studied six photographs of this dead soldier made by photographers Timothy O'Sullivan at the Gettysburg battlefield in July 1863. Geographic features place four of the six photographs at the southern slope of Devil's Den and two at what Gardner called the Sharpshooter's Den. Fresenito argues that the original location of the body was the southern slope of Devil's Den, suggesting that the soldier was probably an infantryman killed while advancing up the hillside. It is thought after taking pictures of the dead soldier from several angles, the two photographers noticed the picturesque sharpshooter's den 40 yards away and moved the corpse to this rocky niche and photographed him again. A blanket visible under the soldier in another version of the sharpshooter's den image, not shown here, may have been used to carry the body. The type of weapon seen in these photographs was also not used by sharpshooters. This particular firearm is seen in a number of these scenes at Gettysburg and probably was the photographer's prop. The amount of time expended photographing this body indicates that this may have been one of the last bodies to be buried, and they have felt that he was running out of subjects. So the idea of not only authorship, but manipulation is one that has caused controversy throughout the years. This is, remains a landmark, as you can see the image on the left I found on Facebook. And you can see the guy standing there having his picture taken at this same exact spot of this photograph. Looks like the rock wall has been rebuilt. After the war, O'Sullivan was one of the most experienced photographers of his time, and he was hired as the official photographer to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Starting in 1867, he took part in several government-sponsored surveys, and he was one of the first photographers to take a picture of the Grand Canyon. There's some of his other Civil War work. 
along with this grisly scene. So you can see the soldiers have yet to be buried. Civil War didn't end till 1865. So these were slaves on a plantation in South Carolina. His survey work, he worked for both Clarence King and George Wheeler in separate surveys looking for routes for the Transcontinental Railroad. We'll look at more of O'Sullivan's work when we get to the pioneer American landscape photographers, and he was an important contributor in the 1870s to those projects.